here in Rockville, Virginia, and I wanted to make a short video that explains the concepts that I found useful in planning multi-axis spindles and multi-axis turning. Um, I'll give you a brief background about me. I, I was a nurse for 21 years, and while I was a burned out nurse the last uh, four or five years of my career, I started carving wood, and I fell passionately in love with wood. I was not allowed in my shop uh, in high school because I was a girl, and that was in the 60s. So um, when I quit my job as a nurse, I went to Aeromont, and I studied wood turning, and I fell in love with the lathe. Came home, it was in uh, the summer of 1990, came home, bought a general lathe, and I've been turning wood ever since. A few years after I started turning wood, I went to a world turning conference in Delaware, and I saw some spectacular asymmetrical turnings, and I wanted to know how to do that. So I came back, and I fiddled around in my shop, and um, I made candle holders and whimsical things just by luck, just by putting a piece of spindle on the lathe, um, making it round, changing the axis, and in a minute I'll show you some of the earlier things that I did without really understanding what I was doing or how to repeat it or even how to talk about it. And finally, I, in 2006, I decided to isolate myself in my shop and try to find if these spindles had anything similar, if there was a way I could think about them or explain them or actually plan what to do. And that's what I came up with the following idea. So I hope you enjoy this video. I'll start by showing you some of the spindles I turned in the 90s before I knew what to how to think about this. This is the very first spindle I turned. It must have been on a rectangular piece of wood because the first axis is separated by a lot of degrees from the final axis. And I guess I thought that these axes had to be really separate in order to make such amazing objects. And uh, soon I learned that it was okay to locate the new axes within the top and bottom of the spindle. So here's an example of, I made little candle holders and just would switch the axis and create a profile on each axis. Most of them were circular like that one and like this one. They were just playful. Here's one that's not circular, and I had no idea why this one looked different at the time, but I think it had three axes. And then here's another one that has both a circular bottom and an arc type top. This one meant that I had gone all the way to the new solid wood on the new axis, <clears throat> on the bottom axis, and on the top I cut into the air wood and created that. So I made many of these. I enjoyed making them. Here's another one that I did. Uh, this one actually has, I had put an axis here and rotated it this way on the lathe and had cut in these cut. There you go. So, oh, I know. Okay. So I was talking about this one. I'm videoing this on my iPhone and my phone rang. So this swang like a propeller between centers like that and I created the cuts on this side and on this side. So I was just experimenting with the orientation of the wood and uh, the cuts you can make and the changes on the axis. I still had no idea what I was doing so I got frustrated and I sort of quit until 2006 and then I decided that there must be a way to organize these thoughts and to actually plan a multi-axis project. So I decided just to turn lots of spindles on smaller pieces of wood and see if I could figure out what these differences were. So this is an example of the circular type that I was making the candle holders out of. This one has three axes and uh, I just started playing around with many ideas. Here's one that has two parallel axes, and instead of going all the way to the solid wood, I realized that I would make a 
a profile into the ghost wood or the, sh the air wood and change the axis and then make another profile on the other side. It, so I, I realized that there are only two outcomes that can happen when you're changing an axis and creating a multi-axis spindle, either an arc type or a circular type. Wow, that was big because now I could start thinking about those issues. Now the second thing I realized through the years, I mean it didn't come overnight, is that um, there are only two basic ways that the axis can be changed on a spindle. And when changing the axis relative to the center axis, it's either going to be parallel or twisted. Now, there's some way to start looking at all these spindles and seeing what they all have in common. These two ideas allowed me to then make a table and say that everything going across this sign for parallel axes, everything is a parallel axis. Everything going across from the twisted axis in these two quadrants are going to be twisted. Everything falling under this symbol, their arcs that intersect, symbolizing the arc type, will be arc type. So you can have arc type parallel and arc type twisted axes. And the same goes for this. Everything falling under the circular type um, can be parallel, circular, or twisted circular. So all the spindles that I had been turning up to now, I could put in a quadrant and it would make sense to me. So soon after this started being clear in the summer of 2006, I decided I'd do a demo at my wood turning club here in Richmond. And it was difficult because I was just beginning to formulate these ideas and it was quite confusing. I'm sure all of you understand the issue of the brain cramp when you're dealing with multi-axis work. So I stumbled through it and I did the best job I could, but my friend Tom Crabb, who does a lot of multi-axis uh, turning, more faceplate turning, and he's demoed for the AAW, he's retired now, but Tom came up to me and said, wow, Barbara, you're really on to something. Why don't you do this demo at our state conference in Virginia the summer, the spring, uh, the fall, I mean, of 2006. And I did that. And at the end of the two hours that it took me to explain how all this might fit together, people seemed to get it. But I heard some comments saying, well, I thought I was in the wrong class until I finally got it. And I did have one very significant comment from a retired uh, math professor at one of our military um, universities who had written uh, an email saying that that was one of the best demos he's heard. So I knew I was onto something. So the last, um, since then, since 2006, and this is now October of 2015, I've focused primarily on understanding and creating multi-axis work. I've taught about it. I've I had a video that I made in 2010. It became obsolete because I started learning more about this area. So I made a PowerPoint presentation, which I could use when I was teaching. And then I developed that into a book that I sell through my website. Uh, and I can add on to that book. I publish it here at my house. And every time I discover something new, I can put that in the book as well. So it's up to date and current. So now the rest of this video is going to, you're going to see what all this means. So I started using smaller pieces of wood and I found that it's important when you're making things thin to round out the entire piece of wood rather than keeping the end square. And <clears throat> I always started, I started taking notes on the wood. At first I took notes on a piece of paper and I had no idea what they meant. So I will scribe a line about a half inch from the ends of each of the uh, headstock and tailstock. And then if I want to be accurate, I can scribe a circle on the ends so I can create axes that are the same distance from the center axis. Now, if I'm going to make 
parallel axes. I always use a magic marker because it's important to really be able to see what you've done. If you put, if you use a pencil and you can't read the axes, then it adds another layer of confusion and this is already a very confusing topic. I'm going to do two parallel axes that are in the same plane relative to the center axis. I'll mark one and two on the sides. I'll bring down that same plane to the headstock end to the other end and I'll mark these with the same numbers. In other words, one and one and two and two. Now there's an explanation for that and it all involves being systematic when you do this kind of work because if you're not then there's another area of confusion and um, design change. So now I'm going to press in these other axes and I'll press them in where I described the circle so they're equidistant from the center axis. I will do an arc type first which means that the new axes can be closer to the outside of the spindle and that'll give me plenty of wood, of room to um, turn a profile. So I'll press in both ends. On smaller pieces of wood you want to be careful not to be so close to the outside that when you press in these axes you split the wood. Now I need to adjust the tool rest to make sure that this this new axis is not going to be hit by the tool rest. Now I can turn the lathe on and I think you can see the solid wood as opposed to the air wood. The solid wood is the wood that is spinning between the headstock and the tailstock and this other wood that creates the, you only hit it every now and then. see that there has been a cove cut on the um, air wood. And I'll change the axis. That was axis number one. I'll change it to the other axis, number two. First, let me just show you now that looks. Now we'll put it on number two. Make sure it doesn't hit the tool rest. And I think I'll turn a bead on the second axis.
Now I stop and I start the lathe many times just so I can see how my cuts are progressing. I'll make a V cut at the other end and then I'll put a bead. I'll connect the V cuts with the bead. So far, these two arcs are just about to intersect in the middle, and they've intersected on this end, which just means I need to make this deeper cut on the bead. of an arc type spindle. It has two axes that are parallel and they're in the same plane of the center axis. And I cut a cove on one axis and a bead on the other. Now I started here because if people, if you're just beginning to explore about multi-axis turning, I suggest that you start with a very simple idea a simple, whoa, my camera's falling off. Well, this is just one example of the first quadrant that I mentioned, which is parallel axes and arc type, um, meaning that you don't go all the way to the solid wood, but you create profiles. And as each, uh, each profile intersects with each axis, it becomes arcs that intersect. Here's one example, that's a bead on one axis and a cove on the other. Now, most of these spindles are turned just like the one that I'm gonna show you, are turned just like the one I just turned. They're parallel axes in the same plane with the center axis. Here's one that I did, which is alternating V cuts. These were all done when I was experimenting in 2006. This one, which will become significant uh, I, in the last year, this, these are alternating beads on two parallel axes. These are alternating coves. And here are alternating coves on four axes, parallel, at 90 degrees with each other. And they're all in the same plane as the center axis. They don't have to be, that's just the way they were. And here are um, parallel axes that intersect at 90 degrees. And on these two, you just create a flat cut. And then when it gets twisted 90 degrees, you do the same thing on the next axis and on the next axis. Here's an example of the same thing with this 
uh, two parallel axes and another two that intersect at 90 degrees. So on the top half of this spindle, it's just like the spindle I just turned, a cove on one side and a bead on the other, and then switch it, turn it 90 degrees and do the same thing on the bottom. So you can play around with these ideas and just in this one quadrant, get some pretty fun designs. Here is a walnut spindle. I have three axes, theoretically, that are separated by 120 degrees. And on each axis, I created a cove. And here's one that has uh, these, ha let's see, five, six, six different axes that intersect at 45 degrees. So 90 degrees and then 45 degrees. And on each one of these axes, it's very similar to the one I showed you here. But instead of just um, each axis being 90 degrees apart, each of these axes is 45 degrees apart. So there's one, turn it, there's the next one, the next one, the next one, and so on. So I think, and here, okay, here's the one other one. These are parallel axes. They're coves that are opposite from each other. Here's just a few of the spindles that I turned that are found in quadrant one. There are many, many more. And from these initial ideas came a lot of other work that I've done Before I go ahead and turn a uh, spindle from in the arc type area but twisted axes, I want to explain one thing, that each quadrant, in each quadrant lives many, many spindles that have two things in common, either that they have parallel axes and arc type, they're parallel and circular type, they're twisted and arc type and twisted and circular type. So you can start filling each quadrant with playful ideas uh, of things that maybe you've never thought of before. There are many other variables that exist with all spindles no matter what quadrant they fall in. These variables can be seen I like to categorize things in my brain. So if you take a look at one spindle, it has a piece of wood, it has a profile, and it has an axis. If you break down all of these other variables that exist in every quadrant, you can reference these in your mind to these elements. Let's start with this piece of wood. The size and the shape of the wood makes a huge difference. Let's say we turn an object uh, on a long and slender piece of wood and then turn that very same idea on a short and squatty piece of wood and see how the design changes. So that's the size and the shape of the wood make a huge difference. And now let's take a look at the profile. If you think of all the beads and the coves and the V cuts and the straight lines that have been used for centuries for architectural spindles then what's been made is limitless in terms of the ideas, the combinations of these profiles on the size and the shape of the wood. And that's just with one axis. So a profile, I break it down into very simple uh, ideas. And that's just a bead, a cove, a V-cut, and a straight line, any combination of those. And then you think about the axis. Well, um, the axis can be placed anywhere on each end of the spindle. They can be separated by equal numbers of degrees, like 120 degrees to get three axes, or they can be randomly placed. They can be closer to the center axis or closer to the outside of the spindle. In this drawing here, if this is, this is about the way I just turned that other spindle, parallel axes, I had the new axis closer to the outside of the spindle. That means the solid wood is just that big, rotating between the headstock and the tailstock, 
and the air wood is all this wood out here that I was able to cut the bead and the cove in. However, if your new axis is closer to the center axis, then the radius is from the, that axis to the outside, and the solid wood is a much larger piece of wood than it is when you have your new axis closer to the outside. And this means you have more room on which you can turn a circular type of outcome, or you could turn an arc type as well. So these are just some of the ideas about the variables that apply to each quadrant. I'll also take a minute just to go over some of the tools I use and the reasons why. I always like to say there's no right or wrong way to do any of this. It's just the tools that you were um, used to using to make spindles with. The, what matters is that the tools you use, you can reliably turn a bead or a cove or a V-cut in one axis. If you can do that, then you can certainly do it with many axes. Let's start with the drive center. I randomly just got this from Woodcraft many, uh, probably in 2006. They don't sell them anymore. It's a half inch diameter, four prong drive center. It's become my favorite tool to use, my favorite drive center to use when I do this kind of work. The points are ground back a little bit so that they dig into the wood, but if you make a catch, it doesn't break the wood, it spins out. Here's a more common, commonly found um, drive center. It's not my favorite thing, but it works. I'm working on trying to get this more available in the United States. It's a half inch in diameter, just like the One Way Live Tail Center is a half inch in diameter. I like the way that gives me room to really uh, use push into the spindles. I use two tools most of the time. This isn't one of them because that is, I'll start with this one. This is a half inch deep fluted bowl gouge with a U parabola type curve in it. And it's sharpened flat on the top with a 45 degree angle off the bar. And it's a roughing gouge. And I use this to rough, rough things out with and also make longer cuts on uh, an off center turning. I prefer using a tool that I can make the smoothest cut with because sanding is no fun. As a wood turner, we all try to avoid that. Ah, now here's a half inch spindle gouge. It is my favorite tool. It's sharpened at about a 30 degree angle off the bar, but it can be a lower or a higher angle, angle depending on how deep you want your V-cut, how narrow you want your V-cut to be. This is my skew. Uh, I never did get along with the skew, but I do love the control I have with the spindle gouge. If you use a skew or another tool to be able to make V-cuts and beads reliably, then that's what you should use. I use these two tools 99% of the time in all of my off-center multi-axis turnings. Next, I'll be turning an archetype twisted spindle. I'll make three axes and twist them at 120 degrees. the ends of the spindle so I have enough room to make an object out of this or to remind myself of how I turn this. I have scribed three axes that are 120 degrees apart. I have a drawing like this on my bench so I can put this there and find the 120 degrees and center it. I have marked one two and three on one end and the corresponding numbers on the other one two and three they match each other the reason i do that is because you need a systematic way to remember what axis you've turned now i'm going to the other systematic way i think is if i start on one on the headstock i go to number two on the tailstock 
I go from the lowest number on the headstock to the next highest on the tailstock and so on. If I want to reverse that curve, I can't think backwards because I might get a brain cramp, so I will number these in the opposite sequence instead of going one, two, and three around counterclockwise, I'll go one, two, and three, and that way the twist will be re reversed. The reason that I put these numbers on the outside is if I put them on the inside, the points would make them hard to read, but also if you look at the ends, one would be clockwise, the other would be counterclockwise, and that's a lot to remember because you've got all these other things to remember. I like to make things as simple as I can, so I mark them on the outside. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn a cove on each axis between these lines, these black lines. So that was from one to two. Now I'm going to change it and I'll go two on the headstock to three on the tailstock. Two to three. Yep. measure the depth of cut so that each one of these is the same. I can take a popsicle stick and I can use my tool rest as a reference point and I can measure the depth of the first axis and then match that on the second and the third axes. Now this is the third axis. Three on the head stock in. The one on the tail stock in. And notice that I turn as fast as I can because my goal is to make a smooth cut. And I can either slow my tool down or turn up the lathe speed. So I try to do each. So here's an example of three twisted axes at 120 degrees apart. Now there are many other spindles that can be found in that second quadrant, which is twisted axis archetype. Uh, so all these, all these quadrants have a lot of room for you to experiment and play. Okay, now I'm going to turn a circular type twisted axis. The reason I'm going to that quadrant, quadrant number four, is that I really, I'll show you after I turn this, I haven't found anything that I've found pleasing in the third quadrant, parallel axis and circular type. So that's why I'm going to show you number four. I think most of my earlier work, those uh, first candlesticks I showed you that I turned in the 90s, were mostly in that fourth quadrant. So I've already numbered this. I've separated the axes at 120 degrees. I've put the new axes closer to the center axis. I've pressed them all in. And so I can start on this end at one, and I'll go from one to two. So what I'm going to do is just define, I'm going to do three axes. I'm going to define each axis with my uh, spindle gouge. I'll find the 
solid wood and then I'll create a profile on it. all the way around and now I'm going to create a profile on that. much about sanding but I can tell you this that if I'm going to sand a circular type spindle I will keep my hands on one side and I will take a piece of sandpaper and I will sand it before I move on to the next axis. If you start putting your hands over there if you have a larger piece of work on your knuckles will get hit probably by the air wood coming around. So that's how I prefer to sand. I, once I leave that axis, I may not come back to it. It might be harder to find. So I want to make sure I've done that as, as well as I can do it before I move on. That's number one. I'll do that a little bit better. Now I'll go from, that was one to two. On the headstock, I'll put it on two. I'll go to three. All these holes have been pressed in. Now I don't have to put a ton of pressure and you can see that if I put a lot of pressure up here, there'd be no wood supporting it. So I'll tighten it up and now I'll work on that middle axis. stop and start a lot and see what I've done. I want, this is going to be a disc, the way to connect the two axes and I don't want flat spots on it so I'll back that cut up so I can create a nice crisp edge all the way around that disc. right here so I can back that cut up and make it a little deeper there.
about planning a lot and also how this is playful. I plan to do three axes there. I hadn't really thought about the profile I'll do on each axis, so that becomes more playful on my part to take a look at it and see what I might do. So this is a combination of a systematic way to figure out a spindle and then to play with some ideas you might have. Okay, so that's axis number two. Now I'll go from three to one. Now I really can't put any pressure on this because it might break, so I see how it's flexing a little bit. But as long as I have those holes pre-pressed in, then I can create a third axis. I need to take very light cuts. And I'm finding the solid wood now on this last part. and see what's happening right here. Oh good, I can make that cut longer there. looking good. That disc has a nice crisp edge on it. Now that I've found the solid wood here, I'll just make a profile. a circular type twisted axis. Look at all the fun you can have with these. These can become handles to a goblet. They can become, if you use a larger piece of wood, they can become uh, candle holders. 
there are, it's endless the amount of things you can do with this these ideas one other idea I wanted to share with you on this video is that any spindle you can make in quadrant number one which has parallel axis and arc type any spindle there you can make as a split turning either putting two pieces of wood together and rotating them two or four times or four pieces of wood together and rotating them two or four times. The only constraint is is that you use the very center of the pieces as the uh, axis that you use to turn them on uh, and they become parallel. Now why would you want to do four at a time or two at a time? I started wanting to make larger multi-axis spindles and the vibration on the lathe is a consideration so I found that if you put two or four pieces of wood together and have an idea and make it you can you can turn very large pieces of wood between centers and and not have the vibration be a huge issue so all these things that I've described to you have been written about in the American Journal of Wood Turning starting in 2006 if you go to my website www.barbaradill.com there's a link not only to this YouTube site but to all the articles I've written and the handouts that I give out so please do that the book is advertised there I sell it for $30 it has everything I've learned in it and lots of images to go with it so go and have fun and play and enjoy this I think it adds a whole new area to what can be done between centers on a lathe. Thank you.